and we'll go live now. We'll give it a minute or two to give folks time to join us. All right. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica from Greenlight and we are thrilled to host tonight's event with Leila Alamar presenting her new book, Silence is a Sense. She'll be talking with Zara Hankir, so you are in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Leila, Zara and the team at Algonquin Books for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces right now, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. So just a couple housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see and hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of fellow attendees on the top of your Zoom screen. There are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like a speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. You can post any time throughout the event. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, Silence is a Sense, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations 12 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase Layla's book and many others on site. Or you can order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S., and I'll drop the buy link in the chat in a moment. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. So introductions. Our interviewer tonight is Zara Hankir. She's a Lebanese journalist who writes about the intersection of politics, culture, and society in the Middle East. She's the editor of the best-selling book of essays, Our Women on the Ground, essays by Arab women reporting from the Arab world. Her writing and journalism have appeared in publications including the LA Times, BBC News, Bloomberg News, and Vice. She's gonna be speaking tonight with our featured author, Leila Alamar. She's a writer and academic from Kuwait. She has a master's degree in creative writing from the University of Edinburgh, and her writing has appeared in The Guardian, Arab Lit Quarterly, The Evening Standard, Quail Bell Magazine, The Red Letter, St. Andrew's Prose Journal, and Aesthetic Magazine, among others. And her story, The Lagoon, was a finalist for the 2014 Creative Writing Award. She was a 2018 British Council International Writer in Residence at the Small Wonder Short Story Festival. And she's currently pursuing a PhD on the intersection of Arab women's fiction and literary trauma theory. Her new book, which we'll be speaking about tonight, Silence is a Sense, is a beautifully rendered novel about a refugee's escape from civil war and the healing power of community. So Layla is going to start off with a reading from the book and then she'll be speaking with Zara. They're both logging in from the UK tonight, so it's much later where they are and we appreciate their time. Um, please join me in welcoming to start us off, Layla Alamar. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks to Greenlight for, for hosting us. Um, so the, the reading that I'm going to do is from later in the novel. Um, and it, it's a scene that the protagonist revisits uh, compulsively throughout, throughout the novel, uh, or throughout the narrative rather. And it, it concerns a scene from her time back in Syria, which is her homeland. Uh, and when she was participating with friends and her her love interest Khalid in the protests. And so the scene has this kind of core kernel of truth and, and trauma that she can't really touch and articulate. So she just ends up circling it. And so the same basic scene uh, essentially shows up three times in three different er iterations in the, in the novel. And the first time it's kind of straightforward, but there's something a little off about it. Uh, the second time they're presented as though they were puppets in a theater. And then the third time is the one that I'm going to read uh, where the scene really takes kind of a, a hellish, nightmarish uh, bent to it. So it's called The Eye. The cell is limbed in red. 
Hazy, a fine metallic mist hangs in the air, latching itself to the tongue and sliding down a clenched throat. A blood drop sun pulses in the sky. Its rays burn like acid, like gas, like the chemicals he swears he isn't using. Look around, everything is red. The aluminum desks, the white tiled floor, the yellow sponge spilling out of the cracks in the leather chairs, it is all bathed in a heavy maroon glow. No matter how hard I scrub, the window pane will not let in anything but red, red rays. This cell is bordered in oxblood, in burning embers, like a smoldering fire pit. The cell, the word, the concept, looms large in our imagination. Room, house, prison, country, all of themselves. All these places where you are watched and heard and monitored. The only safe space is the one between your ears or in the grave. Usama and Ahmed have blood on their faces and they labor over a fabric that matches. They move their markers over the cotton in silence, nothing to hear but the scratch as the tip traverses the surface, painting it in heavy helmeted thugs with stern mouths and tanks crushed by flowers and birds soaring over water wheels. Death before humiliation. Death before humiliation, death before humiliation is repeated a hundred million times in a hundred million ways. We are trying to tell you that there are worse things than dying. High in the corner, the eye watches us. Like every other time and in every other place, it watches us. The veins are more prominent today, bulging red veins that beat to a soundless rhythm back and forth, back and forth. No brain behind to interpret what it sees. The huddle is gone this time. It's only Usama and Amr bent over the desks, me by the windows and Khaled against the wall. His gaze moving between the eye, the painting of the fabric and the dead world outside. He's in a beige jumpsuit, a white helmet dangling from his fingertips and he looks more tired than there are words for. Do you know they call you a liar now, my love? A propagandist, a terrorist even? Terror. Terror is no longer the one-two explosion of barrel bombs or the pop of gunfire or the knock on the door. No, we have redefined it. Terror is the silence between explosions the quiet before the knock on the door, before the bullet hits its target and you can breathe again because this time it wasn't you. We are breathing because outside the bombs have not stopped falling. We inhale one and exhale the other. It's like thunder behind the eyes, like a thousand drums beating in your chest, like the walls of existence are collapsing all around you all at once. It is like no sound you've heard before. It's done, says Amr, straightening up and cracking his back. Usama concurs with a nod and answering crack of his neck. Yalla! We, the three of us, roll up the fabric until it's a thick scroll. We carry it to the open windows. I turn to Khaled to ask to join us, but he's under the eye now, inspecting it, reaching up with hesitant hands to poke at it, as though it might bite, and my breath catches in my lungs. Yalla, Osama says again, prodding me to release my end of the fabric. We let go, and the cotton unfurls down the side of the building. It's met with silence, a silence so complete it seems to have swallowed the world. The banner flaps and slaps against the wall, dripping red and black onto the empty street below. The wind catches it ripping the fabric from our hands and sending it flying over the buildings. The heavy thugs and tanks detach. Inky blobs fall to the pavement without a sound. The flowers burst forth into color and the water wheels and birds go spinning and screaming into the sky. Behind us, there's a crash. Khaled is attacking the eye with his helmet. 
My heart stops as he hammers at it. Furious, desperate, it drowns out any and all other sounds. Bashing and bashing, he lets out short grunts and yips and what sound like whimpers until the eye cracks and splinters and is ripped from the ceiling to lie in a broken heap at his feet. He's sweaty, jaw locked in a grimace, panting like a feral animal, like the wolf they've turned him into. Is this victory or just another kind of death? Thank you. Thank you, Leila. That was uh, incredible. Um, really, really Thank beautiful. You. Thank you for sharing it with us and reading it so beautifully and powerfully. Uh, this actually, I mean, it's, there's a lot here and I'd love if we could unpack some of it, but I really want to lead with the question of memory and how you dealt with memory and trauma. Uh, and this passage in particular, I think, highlights the way that you were playful between the two. Yeah, you know, memory and trauma are are pretty central to to the entire novel, and um, you know the, the 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 central question that the protagonist struggles with to a large extent is what is memory, and can she trust her memories? Can she trust her mind's ability to reconstruct these memories and to call them forth and and to make sense of them? And so. Really, in many ways, the protagonist's mind is a kind of trauma scape. You know, it's a kind of shifting battleground where, uh, you know, memories emerge, but then they they meld with nightmares and hallucinations and, you know, just raw imaginings and and all of all of these things illuminate or or they're revelatory in their own way as as, as they reveal certain anxieties and fears that the protagonist has and that she's carried with her. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's I think, one of the, the central questions is, is to what degree can she trust her, her own memories and what her mind um, might be shielding her from? That's so true. And, and as I was reading, actually, and I did mention this in a review I wrote about your book, it's sometimes difficult to tell, you know, where the, the memory, the, the authenticity of the memory starts and where it ends. And I loved how you, you flowed um, so beautifully between what could be imagined or just, a, a, you know, a function of the trauma and what was actually real and what happened to her. So that really came through. Mm -hmm. I'd like for us to take a step back just for the, um, the wonderful audience who've joined us tonight. Thank you for joining us. And for you to tell us a little bit about your personal journey. You are Kuwaiti, but you have a dual identity and how that journey had led you to deciding to write this book. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm half American, uh, half Kuwaiti. I grew up in Kuwait, uh, grew up, um, you know, in the region. Had I have friends and family who are all over the region. Um, and, you know, when, when the Arab Spring kicked off in, in late 2010, early 2011, I was, I was living in Kuwait at the time. And so we were all kind of caught up in this, this surge of emotions that, that kind of swept the entire region, you know? And, and as I said, my friends are Palestinian and Lebanese and Egyptian. And, and so we would all gather together and watch what was happening and, you know, constantly tweeting about it and chatting about it, um, you know? And then obviously the situation in, in Syria quite quickly devolved into civil war and we were all kind of, you know, shook by that and, and were watching it very closely. And then the ensuing refugee crisis and, and everything that followed on from that, these were things that I had been uh, very closely reading about and, and following and watching for the better part of the decade, you know, and, and it was always just kind of there brewing and percolating in my mind. Um, these things that I was um, struggling with and struggling to understand how how all of this had happened and and you know how we had gotten to where we were from from that that initial swell of emotion that we all had in in early 2011 and so all of these things were kind of inside me and and then in the summer of 2017 is when I, I got the voice for this character. And I just had an image of her standing at the window in her apartment 
uh, watching her neighbors through their window and, and kind of commenting and narrating what she was seeing. You know, these people just living their lives in, in this English city. And I just started following that voice and I just started writing it down. And, and as I was writing, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, why is she isolated? Why is she disconnected? And, and then I thought, well, maybe she's mute and she doesn't speak and that's why she's so disconnected. And then I thought, well, why is she mute? And then this, this idea of, you know, being traumatized into muteness um, came to me. And it was just a matter of following those questions of why is she like this? And, and that, at that point, you know, everything that I had been thinking about over the past 10 years found itself, you know, funneled in through this character and through her story. Yeah, the, for me, it re that really resonated this idea of her being, you know, in her own personal private space where, you know, she can control everything around her and then observing the exterior. And what really stood out for me was the idea of compartmentalization throughout the book. It was not just of her own trauma and coming to terms with the trauma and how she dealt with her um, mental health, um, but also it was physical compartmentalization where you're really envis envisaging these different apartments and you're seeing these different people and they have different lives and you're actually thinking it's very it was a very visual experience for me I could imagine what the complex looked like the apartment complex or a council estate however you would refer to it yeah. um and then also the, the the notion of control over her own space so you know mm -hmm. when she would leave her flat or her apartment you would she would have certain parameters that she couldn't go beyond uh, mm -hmm. almost as if if she was to go beyond it she just could not process it or handle it and again I found myself actually visualizing this so I was visualizing that stretch of of, um, of land or it was a bit of a field I think or a park I, I just imagined it and I'd imagined that she wasn't able to cross over um, and and I would love it if you could talk to us about that how you constructed that idea were you thinking actively about this notion of compartmentalizing or did that also come to you organically I was thinking primarily about um, space and safety. So it was, you know, I think her primary motive early in the narrative is keeping herself safe by any means necessary. And her isolation and her disconnection is, is twofold. So it's a physical isolation. It's a physical keeping herself apart, as you said, you know, where, um, you know, early in the narrative, she's very much you know, in her apartment, um, or if she does venture out into the city, she has these invisible boundaries that she set. And she knows everything that happens in these invisible boundaries. She knows every single alleyway, every single store, nothing can surprise her. And this, this hyper control over her environment is a way to ensure her own safety, much in the same way that her, 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 isolation from other people and her disconnection from other people is also to keep herself safe uh, in terms of, you know, if she doesn't make friends, if she doesn't fall in love again, she won't lose anyone and she won't feel that pain of everything that she's left behind. Um, so so it, was, it was primarily a question of being safe. And, and, you know, when you think about war and what war does to your sense of safe space, you know, and, and a city that comes under war, the space just gets constricted and constricted and constricted. You know, maybe it was like 10 blocks and then suddenly it becomes six blocks and then suddenly it becomes four blocks and you, and you just try and hunker down to stay safe. And then, you know, of course, in her journey across Europe as a refugee, this idea of safe space would also be very dominant in her mind. Being out in the open, being exposed all the time uh, would leave her feeling vulnerable and at risk. And so I think, you know, at the beginning of the narrative, that claustrophobic sense that we get of her just being in her apartment all the time is a response to these preceding years where she did not feel that she was ever in a safe space. And so now she wants to control where she is because she thinks that that will uh, lend her that safety and security that, that she's been missing. 
Absolutely. And another scene that stood out, no spoilers, but it, it has to do with that same idea of, of claustrophobia, of being in that in that very tight space. And that's mm -hmm. when the refugees are are coming um, by land in a in a van. Um, mm -hmm. And that that was lorry, yeah. yes, in a in a lorry, sorry. It was a lorry, right? Yes. Yeah. It was in, yeah, it was an incredible scene. And it also underscores the the sheer desperation and the despair, but also the understanding that they must be doing this for a better mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the, the the other very sort of obvious through line um, was the notion of ass assimilation. You know, how do you then deal with coming to terms with this new society um, and all of the, the norms of that society, which to my mind, she viewed were very peculiar or strange or different, and she was fascinated by them and she studied them. And that really, that really stood out to me too. And I'd love it if you could talk about that. Obviously she also talks about, or she writes about this. Mm -hmm. um, she, she, for, for the, the audience, she's a, um, a journalist or a writer who writes under a pseudonym um, anonymously for uh, a, a national magazine in the UK under the um, the pseudonym The Voiceless. That's correct, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, she touches on some of these themes as well, and we, and I'll get back to that. But I'd love for you to talk a little bit about assimilation, how mm -hmm. she finds herself kind of gradually assimilating, but really rejecting the idea of assimilation at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I think it, to a large part, she is she's a little confused by the whole process. Um, you know, and I think for her, she, she doesn't want to assimilate so much as, um, as a concession to, to what might be seen as a dominant or host society. I don't think for her, it's about that. I think for her, it's about disappearing into, um, a city where she won't be marked out as different. And, sh and again, that's a, another function of safety, you know, that if, if nobody marks her as different then she can just pass and be invisible and, and she won't be at risk. So I think a lot of her, her motives stem from that. But then, you know, as you say, she's, um, she's writing for this online magazine. So she, she's, she's entering into this dialogue, right? And I think that for her, it's a new position to find herself in to, to be looked at as other. And, and that's a new experience for her, I think, because, you know, when, when you grow up in, in the Arab world or you grow up in those societies, you're not different. You know, everybody around you is, is Arab or, you know, Muslim, Christian or whatever. This is your society. So you don't have that other rising gaze. And then suddenly you're dropped into uh, an English city and suddenly she's being confronted with the way other people see her. You know, they see her as an Arab or as a Muslim or as a refugee. They've assigned all of these labels to her that don't feel right or that don't feel, you know, the way that she internally understands her identity. And so I think that that's, that's where the struggle of her, you know, trying to assimilate or trying to disappear or trying to fit into this society comes from is, is that all of a sudden she's being seen in all of these different identity markers that she never thought of herself that way. Yeah, and that's so true to the, um, the immigration experience, I think, in the sense that, you know, you might not be thinking of yourself at all um, as even different but you're made to feel that way mm -hmm. when you are in in a new society um and it's it's almost like a natural um outcome of of being plucked from your your homeland in, in such a traumatizing way um i'd love it also if you could talk a bit about josie so josie is the white uh, female editor who <laughs> who works at the magazine and to my mind um she really represents or she manifests that tension yeah. attention that we're speaking of right now, which is that she's yeah. almost exoticized her trauma in a way. And she's yeah. kind of teasing her, like, you know, just tell us a little bit more about your experience in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have opinions, but uh, they might be a little bit too over the top. Right. So, so again, she's, she's presented with rules 
as to how to tell her own story and her own narrative when she wants control over that narrative. I would, I would, I mean, my analysis, analysis would be because she wants to protect herself. So it goes back to this idea of protection. So she'll share the story when she's ready. She doesn't want to be pushed into it. But Josie is this constant, like, yes, we'll accept you if you present yourself as this and you tell us this story, but not quite that one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you you got it exactly right, I think. Uh, that is the nature of, of the struggle between them is that uh, you know, so often in the media, these these stories become commodities, you know, and, and they're trafficked in and, and, you know, traumatized persons, you know, whether they be refugees or, or, you know, traumatized in any other way are made to perform and, and, and perform that trauma again and again, and, and to, to express it and, and not just express it, but to express it in a certain way, you know, like we, we've, we've, been, we've gotten these assumptions now about what a refugee narrative should look like and, and, and what shape it ought to take. And I think that Josie understands those parameters and, and she comes from this media machine, you know, this media model of getting people to click on the link and read the article. And, and she understands what the reader wants and how they want to consume these stories. And so she's trying to, to get the protagonist to meet those expectations. The protagonist herself, I think, I think, you know, to a certain extent, she wants to please Josie, like she wants to be able to tell her story, but she doesn't understand the rules. She doesn't understand this framework. And I think also it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about memory is that she doesn't trust her memories. And so Josie keeps prodding her to, to, to pull out something more personal and deeper, but she doesn't trust those memories. And so she, she's hesitant about presenting something that she doesn't fully have faith in herself, you know, and to be able to construct some sort of narrative that, that is easy to consume and is easy to understand. And so I think that that's, the, the struggle there. And, and you're absolutely right, you know, this idea of who gets to dictate how a story is told. Is it the person giving or is it the person receiving? Uh, and, and, you know, what we have now is a case where the receiver is in power and the receiver is the one who is dictating what we hear and how we hear it. And so, you know, with, with this novel, I really wanted to wrestle some of that control back and give it to the protagonist instead and see if, if the reader will, will follow along and will, will stay with this protagonist even if the story is not given to them the way they expect or the way they, they, they might even want to hear it. Yeah, and to that point, what I particularly loved about this book and how you brought her to life, how you brought this character to life is she's really not predictable. Mm-hmm. Um, I found myself very surprised at different moments of the novel and, you know, you know, it could range from anything to her sarcastic tone to how she was managing her trauma. For example, you touch on self-harm at certain points to how she was speaking to the people in her compound, in her, um, in her estate or however you want to refer to it, her apartment complex. Um, And also how she dealt with uh, the issue of white supremacy and Islamophobia, which again, the, this is a theme that comes up. And to my mind, she was not at all this stereotypical notion of, you know, what a Syrian refugee woman would be. Even the fact that she writes fluently in English and speaks fluently in English, I think that already you're sort of, you know, because so many Syrians do, right? And, you know, you, you're already kind of shifting the narrative around a lot. And I really wanted to say that I appreciated that. I, I've, I found her to be very layered as a character and very surprising. And, and you know, constantly I was, I was rooting for her in a way um, because I felt like she was trying to find, she was trying to figure things out, right? I think when you mentioned confusion, this that also really comes through. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about those two themes of, um, you know, well, it's kind of like the backdrop that she's she exists in, where you have this like looming threat of of white supremacy, and then Islamophobia as well, and her um, going to that store, um, which is owned by uh, a religious Muslim, 
but herself not being re religious um, or seemingly she's not religious. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to tell me a little bit about that sort of everything I touched on before, which is the character development. And then also how that ties into her, you know, approach to Islam or white supremacy. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I always want my characters to be people, you know, and I want them to be well-rounded, real people with all of, you know, the complexities and contradictions, strengths, weaknesses, vices, virtues, prejudices, biases, you know, they need to be real. And, um, and I think that she does struggle a little bit in terms of what her identity is and who she is. And this was a struggle even back home. You know, we, we, we have scenes where she's, you know, talking with her love interest back home, Khalid, and he's this kind of, you know, very like student of Arab politics and Arab history. And he's, you know, an activist and he, you know, schools her on Ahmed Fuad Negim and she's talking about Poe and Yates, you know, and, and, you know, I think that she struggles there in terms of, is she Arab enough? You know, it, does she know her Arab culture and her Arab, her Arab you know, um, literature and, and where they come from? And then, you know, obviously on the journey uh, to Europe and then getting to England, she's struggling with who she is. And I think that, you know, she gets, like I said, she gets marked out in very specific ways you know, and, and she has these labels applied to her that she's a refugee. And then when the, the Imam at the mosque kind of assumes that she's a Muslim, maybe he assumes it because she's Arab and he thinks Arab equals Muslim, you know? So there's these assumptions that always kind of float up where, where these identity markers are placed on you. And I think that that is what she rebels against more than rebelling against Islam or, or leaving behind Islam or anything like that. I don't think that that's the struggle there. I think the struggle is being marked in certain ways and she is not comfortable with any of those markers. And, and so she kind of is reluctant to join that community even though the Imam is, is very welcoming to her. And she does kind of venture that way she finds a sense of comfort and familiarity there, but there's also, it's, it's, it's ambivalent in a way. She doesn't know, you know, whether she should go, you know, and try to be part of that community or whether she should resist it. Uh, there's a lot of tension there that she's struggling with. And I think a lot of it comes back to her own sense of self that she is, is struggling to, to figure out. Yeah, and this also brings me to the idea of the voice, and I particularly appreciated um, that, you know, she's referred to as the voiceless, and she's also mute, and as you know, and I also mentioned this in, in my review, this is something we are pummeled with, particularly as journalists, yeah. this idea that, you know, we give voice to the voiceless. To my mind, that's such a trope. I mean, they have voices. It's yeah. all about amplifying them or or being aware of them and conscious of them and telling their stories and passing the mic and so on. So I don't even know if that was intentional, but it was so refreshing to my mind because I almost felt like you were taking the trope and just, you know, doing your own thing with it. Yeah, was that it was, what you thought it, about? Yeah, it was. And it was a bit tongue in cheek. Like she yeah. chose that name in a kind of sarcastic, snarky gesture. Yeah. Um, you know, because uh, it's it's so often that this idea of, you know, their voices, you know, and you've unearthed these voices or you've given voice to something and it's like, you know, the voice is already there. And 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 I think that that's kind of a, a sarcastic gesture on her part that she's aware of that and she's playing. She's playing with it in a certain way. Um, but it also it also references the title. So um the, the title of, of the book comes from uh, a 1968 uh, poem called Silence by a very well-known Egyptian protest poet, Ahmed Fouad Negim, who, as I just mentioned, is, is referenced later on in the narrative. Um, and, and so in the translation, the English translation to the poem, it goes, mute, voiceless, quiet, mute but our silence is a sense more eloquent than words and everyone who's heard us knows what we say. 
So the, the, the title of the novel came from, from that uh, translation and also the voiceless was a gesture to that as well because the poem, um, you know, the poem speaks to the silencing of regimes, you know, the way they silence their citizens, which I think is, you know, quite resonant with, with what we saw in the wake of the Arab Springs. And so it kind of ties Arab revolutions across space and time, which is something that I wanted to do as well in the novel. Um, but the poem also criticizes people who remain silent uh, or who silence themselves out of fear or as a subversive gesture. The, the poem is quite critical of, of those people as well and says that, you know, at some point you need to break your silence and you need to speak. And so, you know, in a way, all of this is a, is a, a self-critical gesture for the protagonist as well, where she struggles with this idea of is she unable to speak or is she unwilling to speak? And what are the differences there? And at what point will she be able to actually communicate? That's that was beautifully put. And I and I got goosebumps when you were reading the poem. So thank you for, for sharing that snippet. Um, it's a powerful poem. Yeah, it's beautiful. Stunning, truly stunning. Um, I'm curious about someone that you mentioned in your acknowledgments, I believe a Syrian who you Yes. Could you please tell us the story and how we factored into your work? Sure. Um, you know, I'm not the kind of person who believes in fate, but mm -hmm. but meeting him was was serendipity. Like it, it was it was a very, very strange occurrence, uh, you know, how, how that happened. So, as I said, I started writing this book in the summer, early in the summer of 2017. And then later that summer, I was in Edinburgh when I started writing this book, but I traveled down to London to visit a friend of mine. And he said, oh, this guy I know, Faraj, is coming down from Cambridge tomorrow and we're all gonna go and hang out. And I said, okay, I, I don't know who this guy is, but whatever, you know, the more the merrier, ahlan wa sahlan, right? Um, so the next day we ended up going to Hampstead Heath and hanging out, it was a beautiful Sunday. And Faraj, Faraj al Nasser, he's a, a young man from Aleppo, uh, a refugee. So he left Aleppo uh, when he was 17 and journeyed across Europe. I think it took him a good two years or so before he wound up in the UK. Yeah, it was a very, very long journey, very harrowing journey. And he was very open and, and um, you know, brave in the way that he he was speaking of of all of the things that he saw and and what he experienced and then um he arrived in the uk and he was settled with a, a sponsoring family in cambridge and that's still where he is now and so we met that day and we spent like six hours or something on the heath just hanging out and talking and and sub subsequently became friends you know, whenever I was in London, he would come down from Cambridge or, um, you know, we would we would speak and and he was very encouraging and very supportive of the book. And, and you know, of course, I sent him one and he's doing very well. He, he lives in Cambridge. He's he's running a kitchen. He's making food. He has ambitions to be a chef. So, you know, he alhamdulillah, he's doing very, very well. But it was it was very strange how maybe five weeks after I started writing this book, I met him and I told him, you know, on the Heath, I was like, this, this book is happening. And, and yeah, he was, he was really excited about that, but I, I wanted to acknowledge him in the. In That's the lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm curious about uh, how you feel about this genre in general, um, writing about uh, refugees and traumas mm -hmm. and, were you seeking to change something more broadly speaking about the narrative with your book? Um, you know, I think that any addition to a narrative will change it in some way, you know? So I, I don't think it's, it, it wasn't so much that there was an intentionality behind it that I set out to do something. Um, but I think just by virtue of doing something, you will change um, the idea in people's minds, you know, the, their idea of, of refugees or their idea of immigrants, you know, I think just by virtue of presenting them with someone who is a real person, 
you know, and that's, it's, it's such, it seems like such a simple thing to say, because of course they're real people, but, but that's not the way the, you know, the media portrays them. That's not the way that, that people initially, you know, the image that comes to mind when you say refugee is, is a certain image, you know, and it's the image that gets splashed on, on newspapers and headlines, you know, that we're all familiar with, but then, you know, you need to go a step further and, and, and you need to see that these are real people. You know, they have families, they have histories, they had jobs, they went to school. They're exactly like you are just for some, you know, horrible, horrible twist of fate uh, that, that put them in these circumstances and that put them in this position. Um, and so, you know, it, if it's not, you know, like I said, it wasn't uh, this kind of intentional agenda that I had, but it's just that literature gives you that space to present fully fleshed out, well-rounded human beings that might go some way to changing a person's initial view of someone. You know, that I would hope that after reading this book, when people hear the word refugee, something else might come to mind than what came to mind previously. That they and, might stop and, and think, oh, this is not a simple story, that these are real human beings. And to your credit, I mean, many Arab um, and Anglo-Arab authors have been given this space and, and don't quite um, build a character as layered as yours. And in fact, sometimes in seeking to address tropes, they amplify them themselves. And mm -hmm. this is something I'm literally summarizing my my review of your, your book, but that's something that really came through as well. And and I encourage the audience to get this book for for, for that particular reason. It really does feel um, not just profound and sophisticated in terms of of character development, but also um, really uh, changes your views in general. I would say. Um, I mean, I'm familiar with this type of character myself and I was still surprised, right? Or I'm familiar with the context and I was still constantly feeling like I wanted to get to know her more. I liked her as a person, I was rooting for her. Um, I read somewhere that uh, you, some of the essays that the voices had written were from work that you'd already written. Is that true? No. Oh, okay. No. I think someone wrote because <laughs> yeah, because I do the the novel plays with different forms so yeah. you, you do see some excerpts of, of articles that she writes you do see drafts where she's just drafting the article and it's not the final one yeah um, but those I are not to... those are not things that I had <laughs> written I need no. to take that up and, and send it <laughs> yeah you do you do please send it to me <laughs> Um, I'd love it if someone from the audience, anyone would be um, interested in asking a question. I don't know if, um, if anyone would like to, but please go ahead. And if you don't, I will proceed. I still have many more questions myself. Okay. Well, I wanted to ask you actually on a personal level, as you were writing this book, I know it's very different. Um, you know, nonfiction and fiction are quite different, but for me, at least personally, when I was editing my book, um, which was a, no, a nonfiction book about reporting in the Middle East. Uh, it was it was a, a difficult experience um, and a heavy experience. Uh, and I was wondering while I was reading your book, how it felt for you as you were writing. I mean, obviously it's mm. you're writing a fictional character but you're still touching on so much trauma. Um, mm. How was that experience, the writing experience for you? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, you just mentioned that. And so I'm thinking about the essays now. I mean, it's, it's Our Women on a, the Ground is a phenomenal collection. And, you know, everybody watching, go and buy yourself a copy as well. It's, it's, you will not be disappointed. And you guys did a great job with that. Thank you. Um, it's hard, you know, it's hard when you're, and especially because, you know, the novel is told or the narrative is told in, in first person. And so you really are in this character's head for, for the story and, and her head can be a very dark space. And so, you know, as a writer, you, you need to slide into that and you need to, to slide into that skin and try to immerse yourself in those memories and in those experiences. And it is 
difficult. And there were times where I had to just put it aside and walk away and go outside and, and, you know, kind of remind myself that, that this is not, this is not me, you know, and I need to, to maintain that, that critical distance between what is a representation and what, what I know and I'm conscious of as a representation and respect the material reality that is behind it. You know, the material reality of, of these millions of people who have endured these kinds of experiences and these kinds of struggles um, and to respect that, you know what I mean? And, and so, you know, sometimes people ask me, were, were, you, were you traumatized writing certain scenes? And I'm like, no, trauma is a very heavy word and we have to respect trauma and the idea of a traumatized person. And I would never uh, take on that label for myself. Um, so it is, it is difficult, but it needs to be difficult. And, and we need to be aware of, of that struggle and that uh, tension and, and be able to maintain that, that critical distance between yourself and um, you know, the, this project that you're undertaking versus the actual lived experiences of people. Certainly, and I really appreciate that answer. That was beautifully said. We have a couple of questions from the audience. The first one is from Elizabeth, and she would like to hear a little bit about the state of Arab fiction in the US and the UK, not to assume that it's a monolith, of course. Are there any trends, changes, common concerns you're seeing or extraordinary authors that you're reading? Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of questions. <laughs> I know. Fine, fine. Let's, let's go yeah. with, are you seeing any trends um, in US, UK, Arab literature? You know, I mean, I think for me, Arab American fiction is, is great. And there's, you know, there's a long history behind it. But for the most part, it tends to speak to the Arab American experience. Um, you know, in the literature that I've seen or the literature that I'm familiar with, it's about the experience of an Arab immigrant in a US context, which is a very specific context. Uh, and so it speaks to those experiences, whether it's second generation or whether it's immigrants themselves. Um, you know, so it's, it's very kind of US centric in that way versus um, Arab British writing, let's say, which tends to be a little bit different. You know, you have writing that is, is clearly um, engaging with, you know, Orientalist, colonialist histories. Um, but then you also have writing that talks about what it means to be Muslim in, in, in British societies you know, and, and how Muslim or immigrant communities um, find their way in contemporary Britain, which is a different, again, it's a different experience. But I think those are the, the primary differences is the way that they, the way that they speak to their audience is, is a little bit different, I think, and the way that they handle this representation, uh, this representational burden that they have is a little bit different. Um, yeah, and I think just to throw in my two cents in here, because I had to be very frank, I won't name novels, um, uh, but I had read some novels that very much were focused on the Arab American experience. And I felt there was a lot of self orientalizing there, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that for me was very problematic. Mm -hmm. um, although I, I understand it, my feeling is that it's it's not just that they're writing to the Ar you know around the arab american experience but they're writing for an american audience yeah it's also about who the audience is right mm -hmm. um, so i appreciated that very much in in in, in your novel because mm -hmm. it doesn't feel at all that you you yeah. have target like your target was was someone at a cafe in brooklyn you know yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean, I think I think that's that's a fair point. And I think that a lot of it might have to do with this kind of monolithic idea of East versus West, which which tends to be quite embedded in, in American media, you know, and, and the way that they think is this very separated, very distant, um, two monolithic entities. And I think that that sometimes uh, that can be internalized, like like you said, and and we can see these 
these frameworks reproduced in the literature, you know, in ways that are maybe less helpful, you know, in terms of, of dialogue and in terms of, of, of cultural communication and translating between cultures. Um, so yeah, yeah, so I think- I say that it's, it's, it's in a way regressive. It feels like we're, take, we're, we're mm -hmm. taking steps back rather than forward. It feels, sometimes it feels like we're fighting battles that we've already fought. Yes. And it's like, why are we still fighting them? Let's move on and do something else. <laughs> Yeah, I'm with you. I'm, 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 you put it brilliantly there. Um, this is actually a good segue into the next question from Melissa. Um, what has the difference been between your release and response in the UK versus in the US, if any? Um, I don't think there's been too much of a difference, to be honest. Uh, I mean, the, re the, the reception for this novel has been very positive on both sides of the pond. So you know, I, I don't think it's been that that different. Um, to me, it's it's more about the audience or the reader who's who's actually reading it. You know, regardless of where they are. So, you know, you have readers who are based in the U.S. or based in the U.K. But you know, if they're familiar with the context, if they're familiar with the Arabic language, for example, or with Arab cultures, they tend to receive the novel differently to people who are not familiar with those contexts. They might highlight other aspects of the story um, versus, you know, um, questions of, of, of language and heritage and, and identity that people who are familiar with it might choose to highlight. But it's, it's, it's more about the reader themselves, I think, than, than the reception environment. I haven't felt that to be too different. That makes sense. Um, we have a question from CB, only the initial initials there. Um, are there any books that inspired this one or you think are in conversation with your book? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I can never really pick out specific inspirations, um, you know, for my books, just because I read constantly and I'm, I'm constantly reading you know fiction and nonfiction and and articles and and you know poetry and plays so it's hard to pick out where the inspiration comes from uh i will say that you know for for the more surreal kind of supernatural nightmarish episodes in this book um i always have Rada Saman. she's a syrian writer i always have her in the back of my mind when i'm writing any scene like that because i think she's just a master at that and her work might be available still in english translation i think it's a little bit harder to come by um because i read it in arabic but also there's a there's a south korean writer han kang and her book human acts i read quite quite close to when I started writing this. And, and that was a really yeah, profoundly moving book to me. Um, I was also reading Omar Robert Hamilton's The City Always Wins, which is about the Egyptian revolution. Uh, and I really liked the way he played with multimedia in that book. And he was bringing in tweets and, and real news headlines. And, and it gave the, the book a sense of immediacy. Uh, and, and I ended up doing that as well. But on, on a, a larger scale maybe in, in my book because I had had emails and article excerpts and there's an embedded short story within the narrative that the protagonist writes. So I really wanted to play this idea of, of using multiple forms in order to tell a story. That's great. And you know the audience now has some read, reading recommendations and uh, the Greenlight Bookstore has just linked to the books. So like magic, you can Wonderful. just follow a link. Um, so we're coming to the, the last few minutes. Um, I would love it if you could tell me a little bit about how your first book differed from this book. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know it's very sort of a sensitive question to ask authors, what are you working on next? But <laughs> we're coming to the end of the talk, it's a natural question. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So, so my first novel is called The Pact We Made, uh, and it came out here in the UK in 2019. <laughs> and it's set in my home country of Kuwait. And so it's, it's much more localized. It's much more narrowly focused in terms of um, 
young Kuwaiti women and how they um, kind of navigate a modern society, but still carrying some tradition and, and you know, conservative sense of, of uh, the society that they live in. But it does deal with trauma on a, on a personal level. And in particular, it deals with unacknowledged trauma. So this, this sense of, of shame that women are often shackled with in, in our societies where they can't speak of what happened because of reputation and honor and this and this and that. So the novel deals with, with these issues. Um, but yeah, again, like I said, it's a very, it's a very low, it's localized to the Kuwaiti society in that respect. So, you know, silence as a sense is much broader and it deals with uh, trauma on a, on a personal level, but also on a political level, uh, individual traumas, but also collective large scale traumas. So uh, it deals with how these intersect and overlap and, and how they complicate the, the protagonist's uh, sense of self and how she copes and processes all of these um, traumatic experiences and memories that she has. That sounds great. I definitely need to read it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and what can you tell us about what you're doing next? I know you're you're finishing up your PhD or how far along are you with your PhD? I'm halfway, I'm halfway through the PhD. So um, still have a year and a half, maybe two years to go. So that's that's where my primary focus is at the moment. But I'm always playing around with things. So I'm playing around with short stories or or you know voices that come to me and we'll we'll see if those voices end up being a novel but well we're very excited about whatever you put together next um this has been a great talk really enjoyed meeting you and having this me chat too. me thank too you. thank you Zahra yeah and thank you to Greenlight Bookstore and you know I'll hand it back over to you Leila before we wrap up <laughs> thanks no, so thank much. you Sorry, oh, I wanna, no. <laughs> Sarah, I'll give you the last word. I'm just going to say thanks so much to both of you. And I um, just remind folks that you can get Silence as a Sense from Greenlight Bookstore. The link is there in the chat. Um, so Layla, if you want to say the, the last word, we'd love to have you close us out. Oh, no, I just wanted to say thank you to um, to Greenlight for, for hosting and, and to Zahra for, for being such a wonderful uh, conversation partner. And, and hopefully, inshallah, inshallah, we'll get to do this in person at some point um but thank you and thank you to everybody who came and for all of your questions and and for supporting uh independent bookstores and and writers in these in these difficult pandemic times that we're living in incredible writers do buy them <laughs> thank you thank you right. so much bye everybody thanks everyone have a good night thank you